Jeez. Hi, everyone. This is uh, very exciting for me to be here because I'm an imposter. I'm a fake security person. Uh, but like Addy said, you, you start working on misinformation, you get really deep into it, and eventually it turns out that there isn't anyone else who's really going to be able to, to think about the problem, let alone have any hope of doing anything about it. So uh, hopefully I can, you know, tell you something useful. I have this slide up because he was just asking about it. Uh, I work with uh, kind of a loosely organized group of people, which it seems like we've been doing a lot of uh, related stuff, and this is good that we can all get together and you know see how much we're on the same track here. But this is this kill chain framework uh, that they've been working on for a few years, and uh, that, you know there's some other related pieces here I can share these slides. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, I was inspired by the nature of your talk that I'm going to jump around a little bit more rather than just going through a linear presentation from beginning to end. Uh, so we have this framework stuff. I'm going to get back to the computational social choice thing in case anyone was like super excited about the actual specific title. So th this fits in, this, this is a paper that I wrote a while ago that is, I think, coming out in a cyber defense review soon or something like that, some military thing where I doubt the target audience, I think it was I, poor, poor choice of targeting. Um, but so th it started with what got me started in all this is I had a friend who worked for a company You've probably heard of Cambridge Analytica, and a friend of mine worked for a company that was like an analogy to that uh, in several different ways, except instead of being sort of right-leaning in some sense, it was maybe a little more left-leaning in some sense, but it was analogous in the sense that it was, you know, some smart data science people and then some shadowy international billionaire mogul funding it for his own purposes. And... Uh, in, I think it was May or June of 2016, the data science guy, uh, who, who is someone you might have heard of, and the billionaire guy, who is someone you might not have heard of, got into an argument over the weekend, and then everybody showed up to work on Monday, and the doors were chained shut, and that was it. That was the end of that. So I've always had this sneaking suspicion that some of the things that we saw in 2016 were because there, there might have been a sort of, like, balance of forces of all these different online, you know, manipulation people and then through an unfortunate accident it sort of the the detente was broken and one side kind of broke down but anyway my friend was telling me uh so the kinds of things that they did you've heard of uh, micro targeting that's a lot of the things that everybody's talking about but the question is how do they do this what are the analytical techniques how do you think about this so the 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 territory that you're looking at is not a network with IP addresses and ports and machines and stuff like that. The territory you're looking at is a landscape of human minds that are interacting with each other and you can map them out. Like if you imagine you do a poll, imagine you do a political poll, but it's very general. You come up with say, that's not what was supposed to happen. You come up with say, t you know, a thousand questions about every imaginable topic and you poll basically everyone, so now you have a thousand dimensional data set. So basically each person is a point in a thousand dimensional space. So now you're doing political data science, and there are a whole host of things that come here. Just how many people here are familiar with uh, 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 the curse of dimensionality? Is that, yeah. So. The curse of dimensionality, one way of thinking about it is, imagine if you have a square and then you break it up into four squares, each of them are half the size. So now, like, shunk the square up into a cube and each of the half size squares up into half size cubes, but now you can fit eight instead of four. So when you go up in the number of dimensions, there's more room to fit stuff in and as it turns out, the way that this more room and higher dimensions situation plays out gets absolutely horrible when you go up to very large numbers of dimensions. Um, 
for example, just when this, all these things are, are, in this, are in this paper, just to give you an idea. If you imagine what I just said, but instead of four little, instead of having the square with four little squares in it, you fill it with four little circles, and then you pop it up to a cube and you fill it with eight little spheres. And now there's a space in the middle, so put one in the middle that fits in between all the other ones. So you, keep, you take your cube and you keep popping up the number of dimensions, and then there's the right number of spheres in there, and then there's a space in the middle, and then you po pop one in the middle that's the biggest one you can fit. When you get up beyond about seven dimensions, the one in the middle is bigger than the cube. So things get really crazy in high dimensions. And one of the reasons that this matters is because, go back to this political poll that I was talking about. When you have maybe three or four issues that anyone knows or cares about at any one time, which is maybe the way things worked in the 50s or 60s when there were a few news networks that everyone watched, then there are three or four dimensions that people might disagree on. But when you have you know, 500 cable channels and 5 million YouTube channels or 500 million or you know, essentially an unlimited number, then the number of topical dimensions that everyone might disagree on is more. So the fact that the number of dimensions is more means that they are farther apart and can't find each other because this large dimensional space has an enormous amount of room in it. People are just lost. So this was the kind of thing I was thinking about before I got to the part a little further along, you know, passing from 2016 into 2017 and started to realize that there was this adversarial element and the news was coming out about the Russian uh, active measures and stuff like that. So I'm thinking, okay, so if you're looking at everybody in this space, and now there's an adversarial element. So now, now you actually are looking at an adversarial question in a space where you can put numbers on things. So for example, I'm just gonna walk through, this is a little toy example that I have here. Uh, this is called a Nolan chart, social and economic. Uh, so you can imagine taking a one-dimensional political spectrum and turning it into two dimensions. This is a common thing that uh, political science people might do. But just think of this as a proxy for an arbitrary number of dimensions that people might disagree on. So actually, let me take a step back here and give a bit more of a, uh, what do you call it, like a, a qualitative story of where I'm going with this. Now imagine that you are a marketing person who works for the oregano industry and your sales numbers aren't up as high as you want them to be. So you are tasked with coming up with some sort of gonzo marketing scheme to sell much more oregano than you ever could have sold before. So you're brainstorming crazy ideas and you think, what if we just tell people to eat spoonfuls of oregano? That's a terrible idea that would never work. That is not a marketing campaign. It is ridiculous. Now, on the other hand, eating spoonfuls of cinnamon is agonizingly painful and potentially fatal, which means it's exactly the kind of thing that teenagers might want to do on purpose. Nobody wants to eat a spoonful of oregano because that's boring, but eating a spoonful of cinnamon is literally death-defying, or in some cases, death-not-defying. So if you could somehow like seed some videos on the internet and uh, you know, pay some botnets to promote them and stuff like that, you, if you did a good job of engineering a narrative to catch a useful demographic, then you could get this to go viral with or without a little help. And what you've done there is you've suddenly made the idea of eating spoonfuls of spices a thing that everyone is talking about all the time. Uh, I think that the, the cinnamon challenge, which as far as I know was actually a completely organic trend and was not a part of anyone's sinister marketing plot. It was this, I was just using this as an example for illustrative purposes because it won't offend anyone. Uh, you know, there, there, I, I don't know. There were an insane number of YouTube views, like 20s of millions in 
a space of a few weeks or something like that. So this was an enormous trend, and it got everybody talking about this. And you know, uh, under the radar, if you want somebody to eat a spoonful of oregano, it's barely going to register. No one will have any objection to that. So you suddenly made something that was inconceivable before into something banal, even. So that is an easy thing to describe in sort of qualitative terms like that. But you can imagine when you start using this data science framework, there's this idea of the, uh, the Overton window. So when I just said that phrase a minute ago about you took something that was completely unreasonable before and you made it so that it was just kind of normal and boring, the, the Overton window is originally in terms of th this guy, William Overton, he was whining that, you know, you have these ideas on the left-right spectrum and there are things that, you know, never, that, you, you know, that never would have been plausible, but then suddenly they are plausible and so the window is moving and things that weren't conceivable before are starting to become conceivable. Uh, now, actually, there is no left-right spectrum. If you start trying to put everybody on a one-dimensional spectrum, it works terribly. That's one of the things that I learned from my, my marketing data science friend. Uh, it's, it may not even be possible to put everybody into any number of Euclidean spatial dimensions, uh, but machine learning has manifold techniques for dealing with non-Euclidean spaces. Anyway, uh, so... You can generalize the idea of the Overton window to however many dimensions. You can say, if this is the distribution, you can say somewhere in there is the realm of plausibility. That's the window. And out there in the fringe is not. So if you imagine you want to get somebody to, yeah, so the, I, this is I, more detail than you really need here. There's two peaks of concentration and then there's a valley in between, but the valley is okay. So the analogy there is, in reality, there may not be anyone, like everyone may be very polarized about, say, abortion. Everyone is either strongly pro or strongly against. But if you went on a news show and you proposed a compromise, that would be a reasonable thing to talk about, even if you didn't actually get anyone on board. Whereas if you went on a show and you said, maybe, abortion is aliens, then people would just be like, oh, you're crazy, we got to cut to commercial. So that space in the middle is okay, and this implies the idea of a convex hull. So now you have what I was calling the Overton hull, except nobody knew what I was talking about. So if you want to, if you want to stretch the window, so this, what I'm calling this fringe cluster here, the analogy is the cinnamon challenge. You, you probably could, you could spend a lot of energy slowly stretching the edge of it out through traditional marketing techniques. So for example, uh, Enron really wanted securities deregulation. So they spent a lot of money making the Metal Man ad and hiring some very good directors, very good writers. They made a brilliant ad that is a, a classic of marketing. And it convinced people of something that was not that far off from what people believed anyway. So it slightly changed the window and they got the legal changes that they want. But that was a lot of effort for a small change in the Overton window. Now, if you want a big change, it's gonna take generations to do it that way. But if you can create a fringe cluster, then the convex hull stretches out to include that, and then everything in there is plausible now. So that was my example of the cinnamon and the oregano. Uh, you can probably, if you start to think about conspiracy theories and the popularity of Pizzagate and QAnon and so on and so forth, and you know the Seth Rich murder and uh, you know the sh school shootings were actually crisis actors and all this kind of stuff, that you know that like no nobody gives a shit about Pizzagate. That's it doesn't like. The, Russia doesn't care, no political actor cares. Like, it's not important. The purpose of it is that it's opening up the realm of possibility for other things. So it, it's opening up the realm for extreme political manipulation. But now, 
this is you you know this is a bunch of dots on a graph, and um, or a bunch of numbers in a table, but also what this represents is that there is a relatively small number of people that are out in the fringe that you've kind of swept up and got them on board, and you've created what I have been calling a uh, weaponized useful idiot demographic. Because back in the Cold War with the Soviet Union, there was this idea of useful idiots where they would get you know, some Hollywood celebrity to start mindlessly parroting some you know, Soviet catchphrase without really realizing that they were assisting in communist propaganda. Uh, I think it's debatable whether back during the Cold War the, the Soviet Union cared about American workers or not. Uh, personally, I think they probably didn't. They were probably more into geopolitical domination, just like we were more into geopolitical domination. And I, the, there's a saying that no plan survives first contact with the enemy, and I also think no ideology survives first contact with the enemy. But anyway, you, you want to um, change the whole, like if you really want to change the way a society works, you can't just get one person as a useful idiot. You know, maybe that's, uh, you know, for espionage purposes that might be useful or something like that. But if you really want to change the way things are working in a whole society, you need to get a cluster of people, and the cluster of people that you're going to get control over is going to be easier if they're gullible people. And the way to get gullible people to line up out the door is to say something stupid, not something convincing. So this is well documented in the form of the 419 scams. You guys are all probably familiar with these 419 scam emails that are completely ridiculous and totally obvious and not even remotely trying to you know, pass your intelligence filters. And a lot of people wonder, why are, wh like, why are these scammers so dumb? Like, it's, it's a running joke. Well, the answer is that the 419 scam emails are dumb on purpose because that guarantees that if they get a response, it's an idiot who will be easy to scam. You don't want smart people responding to your scam because then you won't be able to scam them. You want dumb people responding to your scam. So if you go out there and you say, you know, the moon landing was faked and the moon is also made out of green cheese, but the green cheese is fake and uh, also something about aliens or crystals or, you know, God knows what, then you're going to get some people that are easy to manipulate. Uh, this was another, uh, another part of my background. I, just, I used to be a big fan of Art Bell just because it was interesting listening to this show and hearing like, oh, wow, that's cool. Uh, pyramids and aliens and all this stuff. And, you know, and it seems so like innocent and, and fun. And now every, all conspiracy people seem sinister because you know, QAnon is like, wow, they could actually like, you know, show up and start shooting at some point or something. You know, I, I don't know. Like it's, it's definitely has changed over the last 10 years. But there's another security concept that comes into play here, which I think is really sinister, which is that once you have, you, like you might trick one person into repeating one phrase as a useful idiot or something, and then maybe later no one cares, or maybe later you're not interested in that topic anymore. But if you get a group of people especially if they're tightly networked through online communities and filter bubbles and self-selection. If you're talking about the movement of demographics through a parameter space, like I'm talking about here, the establishment of a little cluster like that, it doesn't just disappear as soon as you've accomplished your goals. So this is, what, this is what establishing persistence means for an attacker in the domain of weaponized information. Uh, so you, you, know, you build a demographic of people who are on board with you, and then you can keep using those people over and over again for ongoing purposes. So you know, I, I don't think that university researchers who are looking at fake news or you know, like journalism professors they're not thinking persistence. They're just thinking, oh my God, how are we gonna educate these people? But you can't really educate people while they're being really aggressively educated by someone else for a different purpose. I'm not a big fan of education as an approach here. So, so okay, so what do you do here? 
uh, I don't. I don't think I. Some of this stuff I don't. <laughs> I don't write down so much. You go. There's this. You, you can go in the direction that go. You go down some very dark roads, and you start thinking about this sometimes. So. In, in many security contexts, the goal is not to win forever. Uh, I think that the interest, I was really surprised that the, the superbug talk yesterday turned out to be one of the most relevant things for thinking about misinformation. Um, you probably, you, like you're never gonna, there's never gonna be a world without bugs. There's never gonna be a world without bacteria. There's never gonna be a world without misinformation. In fact, if you think about it, even with all this talk about weaponized information, disinformation, fake news, whatever, 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 the actual total amount of wrong stuff that people believe now is probably less than it was 100 years ago. People are probably smarter and better educated now than they were 100 years ago, and certainly than they were 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 years ago. People know more things that are true and probably the ratio of true things to false things is better too. So the problem isn't just that there is wrong stuff. The problem is that it is useful wrong stuff. It's serving somebody's purposes and that's why we care about it now as a security problem. And one of the things that makes this dismaying for a certain perspective, if you're a journalism researcher, from your point of view, there's or a scientist or whatever, from your point of view, there is one piece of, like there's one domain of truth and then there's an infinite number of domains of lies. There, you know, there's, there's one true answer and then everything else is wrong. And if you're thinking that the problem is just that people believe things are wrong, it starts to seem hopeless because you're so outnumbered in information space. There's so many more, kind, there's so many more ways to be wrong than there are to be right. But if you take a step past that and you think adversarially, there, there is a goal, like there is an attacker with a goal. Now, to some extent, the goal is just to sow chaos. Uh, and, you know, if someone really only wants the world to burn and they really don't care about anything else, that, that's kind of a worst case scenario. But in general, everybody wants something and that means that the processes that they're using, for instance, establishing persistence through creation of a weaponized demographic, is, it, there, is, there is a cost to the attacker. They're expending energy on an ongoing basis to maintain persistence of their attack. And that is a thing that can be disrupted. It may not be that you can brick wall it, but you can make it so that it is not effective at accomplishing their goals. So for instance, and it, so now I'm gonna to switch to another metaphor here, which then if you wanted to put this in practice, you would um, you know, probably go back to the data scientists and do a bunch of polling or whatever, you know, and probably monitoring using social media and figure out what the narratives are and analyze the parameters and stuff like that. But Imagine the metaphor of a cynical person who has some enemies in the village. So they go down to the town square and they start shouting about the witches and they rile up an angry mob and they tell the angry mob, this guy that happens to owe me money is a witch, go burn his house. And then the angry mob goes and burns your enemy's house. Uh, and then, oh, that worked so well, now I have another enemy. I'm gonna rile up another angry mob and I'm gonna have them you know, burn my other enemy's house. And you're gonna keep doing that and if nobody gets in your way, there's no reason you can't just keep doing that forever. And people, if people are thinking, oh no, there's no way to stop an angry mob, like somebody stands up and is like, but people, don't, don't you see you're being used? That's, no, that's not gonna work. However, if you stand up and you're also charismatic and you're also loud and you also contribute to the riling of the angry mob and you nudge them off to the side so they burn the wrong house, 
then if, if this guy never manages to get the mob to burn the right house, he's going to stop spending all that energy because it isn't a useful attack for him anymore. So the problem is that there could be collateral damage from an approach like that in the meanwhile. Now, ideally, you would direct the angry mob to an empty house if you could manage that. Um, and so on and so forth. There's, there's other ways that this plays out. If you also get to the fact that the establishment of persistence depends on social cohesion of the group, uh, you could take approaches where you could split the angry mob. You know, you could have like four other really charismatic, really loud people convincing them to go towards four different houses and then the mob splits up, but then it's not fun anymore because now it's four little mobs instead of one big mob and then maybe it peters out without doing any damage. But maybe not right away. Maybe it takes a while for people to realize that this mob isn't getting any bigger, it's just getting smaller. Seems like the party's over. I don't know, maybe, maybe it's time to go home. So these are the kinds of things uh, that can be defenses against these techniques. There's definitely a bit of a um, counter-offensive flavor to all the defenses that I've been able to think of. Because like I said, you know, you can't just, so jujitsu was mentioned yesterday in the Russian Active Measures talk. I had been, uh, I had been talking about Aikido and then somebody, was t somebody else was talking about jujitsu a while ago. Uh, Ran Waltzman is a good person to follow on LinkedIn. He posts a whole lot of just like super good articles and analysis on this topic. He, Rand Waltzman from the Rand Corporation, and no, they didn't name the Rand Corporation after him. He just happens to be a guy named Rand who works at the Rand Corporation. Uh, he uses the phrase information or influence jujitsu. So I had to look it up and find out that actually it was originally jujitsu and then Aikido was an offshoot of that. So I was less authentic than what these other people have been saying. But anyway, you, you know, the idea is that if someone's coming at you, you, you may not be able to just stop them like a brick wall, but if you sort of pivot them off to the side, then they're, you know, they're going to hit something, but it won't accomplish the goal. So anyway, where, how am I at on time, by the way? Does the 15 minutes include the questions time? Okay, let me just go mention a couple things real quick and then jump to questions because I don't want to cut that off. Let's see, we already talked about that. There, there's a, I want to show you a fun So, so I think uh, one of the things that um, you should talk about is uh, what, one of the things that we, attra was attracted, we were attracted to with your briefing was this notion of a weaponized, useful, idiot demographic. Right. Weaponized, useful, idiot demographic. Which is a super cool idea until you start to wonder if it applies to you, and then it's super offensive. Um, <laughs> so it does apply to you. It applies to all of us. Uh, but, but the specific analogy I wanted to draw with a WUID, a weaponized, useful, idiot demographic, was it's no, I think it's no different than what we consider a botnet in, uh, in computer security. And any one of our computers, if it's not properly secured, can join that botnet and be part of a weaponized uh, demographic that then right. it, uh, accomplishes objectives of a certain adversary, right? And right. so uh, uh, what I'm trying to do is draw parallels between what we do to counter botnets and going to uh, Gotti's talk earlier uh, yesterday around, should we kill some of these botnets? <laughs> Okay, should we, should we dispose of these weaponized, useful, idiot demographics, which I'm not advocating for, per se, you know, in a literal sense, but this notion of how do you suppress um, botnets, how do you suppress WUIDs, and uh, w what are the techniques that we have done in the security to, to counter botnets, can any of those techniques apply against uh, weaponized, useful, idiot demographics? Well, so like you said, there's... There, there are these parallels. So if you think of the ideas of uh, vulnerabilities and attack surfaces, the, you know, this, this is from some marine combat manual, this slide I made for a military audience. The, the, the ways that your brain doesn't work right, those, those are the attack surfaces. The cognitive 
biases, the, you know, the de deviations from rationality, the ways that people have knee-jerk responses, th those are their vulnerabilities. Like if you do a threat assessment as a security analyst, if you're doing a tabletop exercise, which <laughs> I, uh, I, I pitched a tabletop exercise to a big company uh, and then didn't, they didn't, didn't decide to do it. So I think in a little, but the fact that they were interested in hearing the pitch sort of supports the idea that this is a trend that you're increasingly going to have people looking at this kind of thing. You know, so if you're going to do a tabletop exercise, you're going to be talking a lot about the cognitive biases and the vulnerabilities. It's, it'll be the same kind of thing as if you're talking about what are the social engineering threats, except on a mass scale. What are the social engineering threats collectively for your whole company? And you probably have to get a lot deeper into it because if you, you know, there, there's a, traditionally, and please, you know, the, again, I'm not exactly the expert here, but in traditional cybersecurity, if you're talking about social engineering, there's a, there's a reasonably well delineated set of things that you're trying to talk people into, whereas in the domain of misinformation, almost anything that you might be able to talk somebody into could be weaponized in some way. Any belief that an attacker has control over, the fact of having control over it is what makes it useful, not necessarily the content or the specific actions that result from it. Which is why I was saying earlier, Russia or whoever doesn't give a shit about Pizzagate or QAnon or whatever. They're, like, they're using narratives that get people caught up into things so that they can control people by, you know, controlling the drip. So, um, with, I, I feel like I didn't answer your actual question. Wait, tell me, remind me which was the part you wanted to hear. Well, it, it's really a question for the broader audience. If, yeah, if right. If we think about a weaponized, useful, it, um, useful idiot as like a botnet, then what botnet takedown techniques would apply for a weaponized, useful idiot? Oh, yeah. So you, you I mean, the, ma the thing that I was talking about before would be analogous to interrupting the control signals in some way. You may not be able to find the servers that are controlling it, but if you can chaff the signals, if you can jam it, if you can you know, distract them and get the bots so that they're not all on the same page anymore, you can disrupt the botnet even if you can't actually find all the individuals. You, you may not be able to find all the individual compromised machines. You may not be able to uh, you know, deterministically clean all of them. But if you can desynchronize them, then they're not a botnet anymore. So that was what I was getting at when I was saying that the fact that there is, a, that there is an attacker with a goal means that there is a thing that can be disrupted. Whereas if you're just thinking about fake news as wrongness, wrongness is a too, that's too much of a moving target. It's too nebulous. But if you think of it as a botnet that is a, coherent, a cohesive thing that serves a purpose, then you can disrupt the cohesiveness of, of it or the purpose of it. If you, you, know, you keep it from hitting its target or you keep it from holding together or even if you just make it more expensive for the attacker to do it, uh, you know, by increasing the level of background conspiracy noise so that the gullible, I mean, if you made a, like, if you started sending out a lot of fake 419 scam emails, which when people responded to them, they, it was just, you know, it was just dev null. Like, no, no, print, no fake prints, not even a fake prints, let alone a real prints. Pe the people will stop responding to those emails because the, you know, the dumb people will respond to the emails and nothing happens, and then they get bored of responding to 419 scam emails. So then the scammers have to innovate faster because you're, you're chaffing their signal. So you can come up with analogies there for that. Uh, X. So I want to show you a cool thing to give you an idea. Like Sunil said, this, 
the, the important thing that I want everyone to understand here, this, so the, these were slides, this particular set of slides was made for uh, people at Special Operations Command. And I'm, uh, uh, and also on another occasion, some NATO people. And I kept telling them over and over again, this means you, the target areas of your mind. You are biased. Uh, biased, this means you. I think I have like 20 slides in here that all say, you, I'm talking to you. Because people don't want to think you're talking to them. So just as an example, here is a... You've heard, you, some of you have probably heard of change blindness or inattentional blindness. So this is actually stolen from the Exploratorium. Is it working? Play Mr. Video here. Okay, yeah, so th this, they have this up on a big screen on the wall at the Exploratorium. And um, do, does anyone just, you know, I don't want to tell you what to look for, but tell me if you notice, j feel free to just shout out if you notice anything unusual going on. A sign changed, there's a non... Okay, so I'm going to play it back at multiple speed, which breaks the illusion with the brain. God damn it, if I can get the fucking thing to... Yeah, so here we're gonna play it at, is it doing it? If you watch it at double speed, the blinks are too short to interrupt your visual processing. And what, so what tends, I, I'm, I'm cutting this a little bit short because I want to leave time for questions. If you watch this video, you can stand there for the whole 15 minute run of the video and you'll be like, oh, I think I saw something every now and then. And then you watch it on an, an altered version that makes you see all the changes and uh, like, there's enormous swaths of the picture are constantly changing. It's, I mean, you might as well be on acid or something. I mean, it's, it's really, really shocking when it, when it hits people. So I probably shouldn't have even done that because I don't really have the, uh, the, um, the, the time to do it right. Uh, but j just a little bit getting into the, into the, the cognitive science there. So confabulation, basically one of the core things that your brain does is that it takes whatever comes in and it tells a story that makes it all fit together. Even if it doesn't all fit together, your brain will tell a story that makes it all fit together. And th this is what all brains do. This is what scientists' brains do. So one of the things you gotta watch out for is people who have been taught that they are objective. People who have been told and have internalized the idea that they are objective and rational are the most biased people because they're not watching themselves looking for all the things they do wrong all the time. <laughs> You're, everyone is equally biased. Everyone, everyone is racist. Everyone is, you know, uh, forgetful. Everyone is confabulatory. If you assume that you are, and you look for those things, then you can make yourself work better. But if you say, I'm just gonna be as objective as I can, you're just gonna make things worse. Okay, so on that note, All I right. do. Any questions, since yeah. we're pretty much out of time. Any questions? Tom. Hi, Tom. Did, have you, uh, were the NATO people you talked to at the STRATCOM Center of Excellence or other NATO people? Uh, it was at, uh, 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 was it CDANS in London? I think it was, yeah, it was not the, the SICON US thing that, 
also that had those Stratcom people that that was sponsored by that. It was a different thing that was sponsored by some magazine that was in January of. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, I would just make a recommendation that if you can try to, I can probably share with you contact information. We'll talk offline. Yeah, let's talk about offline. About the, uh, the people at the Strategic Communications Center of Excellence in Latvia. And if you can finagle a flight to Riga out of the deal, then every, it's a win-win. That would be great. Yeah. Because like I said, I didn't get that big contract, so I'm kind of broke right now. Because they're all over the same sort of space, and I think they would benefit from hearing about Amit and what you're doing here. Yeah. Okay. Other questions, comments before we wrap the morning portion? Yeah, and the really fun part is going to be when the, the people who are really interested in this, will you know, we're going to sit down later because Gaudi is going to organize some stuff. So yes. that'll be when we have the real fun. All right. Okay, with that, we're going to break for until 11 o'clock. So break until 11 o'clock. There's donuts out there. Please.